Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Today we are taking another big step in protecting tenants from unscrupulous landlords. We are signing legislation that makes it illegal to harass tenants into accepting a buyout offer. Amen. There are too many cases in this city of landlords using cash offers to get, to get rent-regulated tenants to move so the landlords can charge sky-high rents. And that will end now. Those days are over. There will be real consequences for this abusive behavior. And I want to make clear the penalties are real. Penalties in the first instance will be $10,000 per unit, per apartment. Any landlord who violates this law will be a fine, the first instance, a fine of $10,000 per apartment. That number goes up with any subsequent abuses. Wanda, you're going to hear from uh, some of my elected colleagues in just a moment. I want to thank and acknowledge uh, some of the other folks who are here with us who have been so supportive and so helpful in this process. Kate Goldstein, the Executive Director of Tenants and Neighbors, got her cheering section here. Camilla, Camilla, I hope, I don't know how to say your name properly. Shadeen, I would never have guessed it. Camilla Shadeen, Associate Director for Housing Law at NYLAG, NYLAG. Thank you. <laughs> Judith Goldener, attorney in charge of the Civil Law Reform Unit Legal Aid Society. <laughs> Natasia De Silva, staff attorney, Legal Services, <laughs> NYC Bronx. And Scott Stamper, the supervising attorney for MFY Legal Services. Want to thank all of you, every, everyone that I've just named, and all the people who work with and for you in your organizations have spent years working against this kind of abuse, protecting tenants from unscrupulous landlords. It has been, sadly, endless work, but you've done it well. And we're thrilled today, I am and I know my colleagues from the City Council are, to finally be giving you some of the tools that you've long needed so we can fight this fight better. So thank you to all of you. Now. Let's put this in context for a moment. The city is faced with an overall affordability crisis. I've talked about this a lot. This affordability crisis is becoming such a challenge for so many New Yorkers. It's existed for years, but in many ways it's deepening because the cost of housing keeps going up. And it would be one thing if we could say at the same time, well, don't worry. Wages and benefits are just shooting up. Everything's going to be great. Everyone's making lots and lots of money and has great, great benefits. No. We found, sadly, in too many cases, the opposite. You may have seen in the paper today, a very powerful new study released. And it pointed out there's a national study that despite, despite falling unemployment and increased productivity all over this country, wages for low-income workers have actually fallen since the 2009 recovery began. So what kind of recovery is that when working people are actually going backwards economically and when the cost of housing just keeps getting higher and higher? That's what we're facing here. And that's why protecting the affordable housing we have and protecting tenants from harassment is so crucial. And we know if, if any New Yorker can afford their housing, that's the number one expense in their lives. If you want to talk about fighting income inequality, one of the best things we can do is make sure that housing is affordable because it's the number one expense in people's lives. And one of the biggest problem is when affordable housing is taken away, especially through unscrupulous means. Now, I always say, and this is my experience, the vast majority of landlords do the right thing, follow the law, treat their tenants with respect. But there are too many unscrupulous landlords. And there are too many, as the cost of housing has gone up, have become even more aggressive in their behavior. They use any tactic they can to drive out rent-stabilized tenants just to make a quick buck. And that means things like knocking on doors late at night, and harassing people, keep coming back to them over and over again. Some unscrupulous landlords have hired people who have a very innocuous title, relocation specialists. Well, these are folks actually paid to harass tenants 
to get inside their heads to convince them they have to leave. And remember, these buyout offers, uh, you know, look, uh, a tenant may look at that offer and in the first case say, wow, that's money I could use. And that's a choice a tenant has to make. If, if the landlord has not acted in an unscrupulous or legal manner under this bill, the tenant has a decision to make whenever that money is dangled in front of them. But let's, let's speak the truth here. Those deals rarely work out in the tenant's favor. They always work out in the landlord's right. favor. For too many tenants, that short-term money dissipates and are left without affordable housing for the long term. And it's preying on people who are economically vulnerable in the first place. That's what makes it so immoral. It looks like a short-term gain, but you know what? You wake up a year later and you don't have affordable housing anymore, and you're not going to find it anymore. It's a trap. So we care deeply about protecting each and every family, each and every tenant. We also know there's a bigger concern for the whole city. Every time one of those rent-regulated units goes out of rent regulation, we've lost affordable housing. It's never coming back. That's why it's so important to make sure that the rules are followed and the law is respected. Let me give you one story. This one is painfully vivid about this phenomenon. A man named Sean, he, the senior who's been living in the same rent-stabilized unit in the Upper East Side for nearly three decades, 30 years living in the same unit. Sean suffers from severe anxiety. He has other mental health challenges. He's unable to work. He's living on disability insurance. You would think the landlord would feel compassion. But no, what happened? The landlord waged a nonstop effort to harass Sean out of his apartment. Knocking on Sean's door every day for months on end, even though Sean had made very clear he didn't want to take a buyout, he wanted to keep his apartment. Sean lives on a fixed income. He literally couldn't find another place to live in this city, the only place he's known. Well, these aggressive tactics by the landlord took a toll on Sean. Imagine if you had mental health challenges to begin with and a disability, and the landlord was preying on that. Sean literally felt a prisoner in his own apartment. He felt he couldn't go outside because he might run into the landlord. It started to make his life worse. It started to change his habits. He started to feel he couldn't even answer the door to his apartment. Went on for about a year, and then Sean contacted MFY Legal Services. And we thank them, because they put an end to the harassment of this New Yorker who didn't deserve what he got. And we want to thank everyone at MFY for standing up for Sean. <laughs> so there's no room in our city for these ruthless tactics. We will not tolerate them. The laws today will ban these coercive practices. First, intro 682 makes it illegal for an owner to intimidate or threaten a tenant over a buyout offer. Second, intro 700A makes it illegal for anyone to contact a tenant about a buyout, buyout offer without sharing critical information. And every consumer will recognize this meaning in this law. Imagine telling someone, hey, sign here, and you're going to make a lot of money. Well, guess what? The tenants often don't get to see the whole contract and understand the full meaning. Under this law, the tenant has a right to refuse an offer and the right to contact an attorney. And the bill prevents residents from being pressured into taking an offer without fully understanding their rights. Intro 757A makes it illegal for a landlord to make a buyout offer for 180 days after a tenant has made clear in writing that they're not interested in the buyout. In other words, it stops the ability of that landlord to just keep coming back and harassing and trying to wear down a tenant once a tenant has made clear their intentions. We want the tenants of this city to know we have your back, we are here for you, and we will stand up to these unscrupulous landlords. We're going to use every tool we have to preserve affordability, to protect tenants, these tools that we are going to these bill, this bills we signed into law today, the tools they create are hugely important in that fight. But it's on top of a number of other big initiatives that are helping right now. The special task force, for example, with the state attorney general, right this minute, aggressively investigating those landlords who are engaging in this abusive behavior. We've already seen some prosecuted. I guarantee you more will be prosecuted. And we want 
those unscrupulous landlords to understand those prosecutions include criminal prosecutions with much greater penalties. We've increased funding for free anti-eviction legal services. That is an eight-fold increase, working closely with the City Council. Well, we've achieved together now $50 million a year in anti-eviction legal services. For the first time in the City's Rent Guidelines Board's history, almost 45 years for the first time ever, a rent freeze that tenants deserve. And we're going to talk about this a lot in the coming weeks because October 1st is when that rent freeze for one-year leases, again, 2% increase for two-year leases, that's for leases that come due starting October 1st. So we really want to make sure that every New Yorker in a rent-regulated apartment knows their rights to these new terms and that the city is standing up for them. And we are reaching out all over the city. We're doing a kind of community outreach, and I know our colleagues in the council believe deeply in this, and they're a key part of this as well. We're knocking on doors. We're going to community meetings. We're making sure tenants know their rights, and they know that help is available to them. And I want to make very clear, right this minute, even before this new law comes into effect, if any New Yorker believes they are being harassed by their landlord, they can call 311 right now, and we will get them free legal assistance. We will not tolerate it. So any New Yorker who feels they're being harassed can call 311 right now and get help. We're just not going to let this problem continue to hemorrhage and undermine the city we love and people who deserve better. We're doing everything in our power to protect our tenants. Quickly in Spanish, hoy firmé tres leyes para evitar que los caseros obliguen a los inquilinos en apartamentos de renta estabilizada a aceptar ofertas para mudarse. Hay demasiados casos de caseros que obligan a sus inquilinos a aceptar ofertas para luego cobrar rentas altísimas. Esas tácticas son abusivas, inmorales, e impiden que New York sea una ciudad donde todos pueden vivir. Debemos seguir trabajando para que nuestra ciudad sea asequible para todos y asegurar la tranquilidad de los inquilinos que tienen el derecho de conservar sus hogares. With that, I want to bring forward the, the sponsor of Intro 757A and the speaker of the New York City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for your leadership and convening us here in Borinquen Court, which is in my district here in the South Bronx. Uh, this is an incredibly beautiful a complex, 145 units here right now of low-income housing for seniors. And we just took an action in the City Council uh, in the last several weeks where we will be able to build on existing land here another 178 new uh, units of housing for low-income seniors with NYCHA's assistance. Uh, so it's really... So I want to thank Wishfish and Laura Jervis and all the board members and all the administrators for welcoming us here today and all the seniors that are here with us this morning. So um, we've come together with a crucial goal here today, and I want to thank the mayor for ensuring that New Yorkers can stay in their longtime homes and communities with dignity and independence without fear of harassment or intimidation. As New York City grows and rents skyrocket, we hear far too many stories of tenants who are threatened, menaced, and harassed by unscrupulous landlords who want to push out longtime residents in favor of gaining newer, more lucrative leases. While ordinary buyout offers can be legitimate, they can also quickly escalate into a form of intimidation, which may include contacting tenants repeatedly at odd hours, as the mayor clearly delineated, contacting tenants at their place of employment without permission, and falsifying or misrepresenting information. Too many residents live in fear, fear of being forced to leave their homes, fear of retribution, fear of living at the mercy of a landlord who wants to kick them out. And for too long, these tenants had little recourse. 
So we're changing that today. And I want to thank Council Member Zidanis Rodriguez, uh, Council Member Gorodnik, and Council Member uh, Jermani Williams for being here today. This package of legislation has been said changes all that by banning landlords from threatening tenants, contacting tenants repeatedly at odd hours, contacting tenants at their place of employment without permission, and falsifying or misrepresenting information. It also will ban landlords from contacting tenants about additional buyout offers within 180 days of being informed in writing that the tenant is not interested in hearing additional offers. And thirdly, requiring that landlords inform tenants of their rights when presenting a buyout offer. New Yorkers have the right to be free of all forms of harassment, and no one should feel pressured, intimidated, or coerced into accepting a buyout offer they don't have to take. And as those pressures continue to build in the city, that is why the building of affordable housing is so critical, and this is an example of that in the city of New York. We're going to have, unfortunately, situations like this, and we hear about it all the time in our offices. We're considering primarily seniors, vulnerable populations that will come to us and tell us the stories of how landlords are trying to force them out. Um, this is just not acceptable. So these laws will protect tenants and keep the buyout process fair and honest. The New York City Council has a strong record of advocating for our city's tenant population and ensuring that they have the legal support they need, including legal representation in housing court. The complex maze of housing court can be difficult to navigate without a lawyer, even when the resident has a strong case. And that is why the New York City Council passed legislation creating an Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator, which is charged with developing a plan to provide access to a lawyer for anyone who needs one, including tenants in housing court. And the mayor also talked about the deep investments in legal services that is incredibly uh, important in this climate. That measure, along with the legislation being signed today, fortifies New York City's legal and regulatory framework and helps to protect tenants and keep New Yorkers in their homes. So again, I want to thank my colleagues, Gorodnik and uh, Council Members Gorodnik and Williams, uh, for sponsoring these bills. I'm the sponsor of one of the bills as well. For working closely with me throughout this process to make sure New Yorkers were heard and represented. This legislation pack the legislative package is a reflection of our joint commitment to New York City's residents. And obviously I want to thank uh, Commissioner Vicki Bean and Mayor de Blasio for their staunch commitment to tenants in our city. I'll be very brief in Spanish. Estamos aquí unidos por una meta, eh, una misma meta, asegurar que los neoyorquinos permanezcan en sus hogares y comunidades con dignidad e independencia, sin miedo a ser hostigados o intimidados. Hemos escuchado muchas historias de inquilinos que son amenazados y hostigados por dueños de viviendas que son in inescrupulosos e intentan sacar a residentes que llevan mucho tiempo en sus residencias por nuevas personas que van a pagar un alquiler más alto. Muchos inquilinos viven con miedo a ser forzados a abandonar sus hogares y tienen pocos recursos para defenderse. Así que estas medidas legislativas que el alcalde está firmando hoy es una manera de darle más, más protección a los inquilinos y darle más herramientas a los abogados aquí presentes que le están dando y prestando esos servicios a nuestra comunidad. So thank you very much, Mayor de Blasio. I want to acknowledge and thank our public advocate, and uh, you know, I think we're having a generational moment here because those of us from the uh, previous city council experience, <laughs> we uh, we worked on some of these issues. But I think Tish, you and I can agree, the current council has taken and gone the extra mile, and done a lot more. But thank you to uh, the public advocate; she did a lot on behalf of tenants in the council and continues to as public advocate. Tish James, thank you. Now, uh, to hear about uh, some of how this bill will play out for our tenants, uh, the woman who's on the front line of creating and preserving affordability for all New Yorkers, one of the architects of our... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Wishfish for hosting us and for all the good work that uh, Wishfish does to provide affordable housing across the city. Uh, HPD, of course, is dedicated to protecting the rights of tenants to live safely and to live peacefully in their homes and in their neighborhoods. And we are delighted that these bills give us yet additional tools in which to keep uh, uh, tenants safe. These bills, intro 682A, 700A, and 757A that the mayor will be signing into law, will place limits on the tactics that unfortunately have been employed all too often by unscrupulous landlords to unlawfully push tenants out of affordable apartments. 
these tactics are not only providing enormous anxiety and grief to tenants across the city, but they are depriving the city of very much needed affordable housing. In addition to limiting the manner in which that the mayor mentioned, the bills also require written disclosures to inform the tenants of their rights and to tell them how to get help and how to get advice about what they should do in the face of a buyout offer. Landlords can face very stiff penalties, as the mayor said, if they violate these legal limitations. And we, and I know I speak also for the incredible tenant advocates in the room, we will do all we can to use these tools and every tool available to us to protect tenants in their homes and to protect the vibrancy of our neighborhoods. And I want to especially thank, of course, the City Council and, and our wonderful speaker, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, as, long, uh, as well as Council Member Dan Gorodnik and Housing and Buildings Committee Chair uh, Jamani Williams for continuing to work with us along with so many tenant advocates and so many in the room to protect and empower New York City's tenants and to protect our uh, very vital and very precious affordable housing. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm not going to say speak of the devil. She mentioned your name. I'll say speaking of an angel. The sponsor of Intro 700A and the chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee, Councilmember Jamani Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, this is a beautiful building. Uh, Wishfish is just a great name, uh, also. Um, but as I, as I look at the building, it's like this is what housing is supposed to look yeah. like. Uh, you shouldn't look at uh, housing and say, that's uh, public housing, that's uh, senior housing, that's uh, housing for disabled. It should be just beautiful housing that people want to live in, and I think this is a great example of that. So thank you very much for having us here. <laughs> uh, of course, I want to thank the mayor uh, for, for his leadership and signing this into uh, law, and just for his leadership in turning the discussion of housing in the right direction uh, and actually exceeding certain goals when it comes to building or preserving the units. I want to make sure he gets all the credit that is deserved. Uh, we have a long way to go, but I want to thank him uh, for that. And I want to thank uh, the Speaker, Melissa Margarita, for her leadership on this package and for uh, helping the City Council be a true partner as we move forward on the housing plan. And of course, we have a partner in our chair, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner uh, Vicki Bean, in making sure that that moves forward. And all of my colleagues and the public advocate. Uh, I also want to thank Councilmember Espinal, I believe one of the bills were in his committee, uh, Councilmember Garodnik, of course, and my staff, Nick Smith, who's in the back. Are you taking pictures? Is that what happened? All right. All right. <laughs> uh, and my committee staff, including Jen Wilcox, Guillermo Patino, has a Jose Conde, Sarah Gasolum, Matt Gawab, and Jeff Baker. Um, and a special shout out to Reggie. I think this is the last bill I'm going to have with you. So a special shout out for, uh, to Reggie as well. <laughs> And just obviously, I think government has to s step in uh, many times. Um, there are most landlords who are doing the right thing, but I think there are too many that are uh, morally deficit in how they manage their buildings and that the dollar, and it's not just making money because many of them are making money, but it's just the quest to make as much money as humanly possible on the backs of the human capital that lives in those buildings and live in those communities. And I believe that is when government has to step in because many of those landlords take their uh, moral deficit up to the line of legality and play with that line with their moral deficit mindset uh, as much as possible and jump over, jump back, and try to play with it. And I think we have to step in to make sure, no, you can't play with it. Uh, we have recognized that it's a problem, and now it is fully illegal, and now it is backed by fines. You can no longer do this. You can no longer harass people out of their homes. Make no mistake about it. Uh, what we have in, in housing is some of our most precious assets. And you can't talk about uh, public safety, you can't talk about quality of life unless you have a community. You can't have a community unless you have housing that's steady for generations and people not moving all around and people who created communities that people now want to live being pushed out uh, because someone wants to make uh, as much money as humanly possible. And I think that's what this package represents. My uh, bill in particular is the bill that makes sure you cannot uh, ask about uh, tenant, you can't have tenant relocation specialists talk about uh, um, moving out without giving them information 
that says you have the right to refuse this request. Uh, you have the right to ask for this communications to cease. And you have to imagine most people just in general can't really understand tenant law. Now imagine if you are elderly, imagine if you may be disabled, imagine if you're an immigrant, imagine if you don't speak the language, all those things compounded and people are harassing you, making you feel like you have to leave your home and making you feel like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 might be a lot of money and as was mentioned by the mayor, it's not because a few months later you have no place to live or you find the money, can't afford it. And that's what's happening to too many people in our city. And I think together uh, with the speaker's leadership and, uh, and my colleague, uh, Councilmember Goranek, we are putting a stop to that. We have a long way to go. I was at a building yesterday uh, that people were pushing, being pushed out because of preferential rent. Um, so there are a lot of things that we have to do. But I know here in the city, uh, we are destined to do whatever we can to make sure that communities stay together. And as was mentioned, when we lose this housing, we lose it forever. It doesn't come back. And so we're going to put people on notice, particularly the immoral and the morally deficit landlords, that you can't do this. You have to honor the community that's there. We want to make sure you make money, but you don't have to make all of it on the backs of people who have made the community what it is. Thank you. Long ago when I was young, I first met Dan Gorodnik who was very much active with the tenants of Stytown and Peter Cooper Village, so you've, uh, you've earned your stripes in that field. And now, the sponsor of Intro 682A, Councilmember Dan Garada. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor de Blasio, for your leadership on this issue, and I thank you in advance for signing these bills into law. I want to note it, uh, it has been a great pleasure for me to work with Speaker Mark Vivrito and Chair Williams and, of course, also Chair Espinal uh, on these bills and on so many bills on behalf of tenants. Uh, as the mayor noted, we all know that we have a housing affordability problem. And this problem is simply exacerbated by the landlords who have felt compelled to try to move usually rent-stabilized tenants out of their units in order to drive up rents. And those who are most driven by this desire to drive up rents have resorted to unscrupulous behaviors. They have broken locks. They've turned off heat and hot water. They've starved buildings of needed repairs, or they've even filed frivolous lawsuits. For several years now, in fact, for almost a decade, the City Council has worked to put these bad actors on notice, and today we are going to take that notice a few steps further. And I will note that in our first term in the Council, the Speaker and I authored a bill that gives a right to tenants to sue a landlord for harassment. And last year, Chair Williams and Councilmember Torres and I formed a coalition to fight back against predatory equity. And this council has even funded an initiative stabilizing NYC in each of the last two years to train tenants to coordinate their efforts to organize and respond to abuse. We've done all of this because landlords have expanded their pursuit of tenants into new and more aggressive manners, like offering tenants in low rent apartments financial incentives to convince them to leave their homes. And while the practice may sound innocent enough, it frequently is not. In recent years, as the mayor noted, landlords have increasingly retained the services of what is known as tenant relocation specialists, agents of the landlord who make buyout offers to tenants. But they don't just make an offer and go away. They are intimidating. They are threatening. They are harassing. They're using any means necessary to get people to accept these offers. We've heard about door knocks at all, day, all times of the day and night, following people to work, going after their relatives, trying to persuade them to encourage you to accept the offer. We already have a word for these kind of tactics. This is harassment, plain and simple. And we are expanding the definition of harassment to include the worst tactics used by tenant relocation specialists as they try to induce tenants to leave. Threatening, intimidating, initiating communication with such frequency at unusual hours or at a place of work or knowingly falsifying information provided to, the, to a tenant, that is no longer going to fly with the actions that we are taking today. Together with these, bill these bills represent a significant step 
toward creating more fairness for tenants. So I thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for your support, the speaker, and all of my colleagues for their efforts getting us to where we are today. Thank you. Uh, finally, representing a district that clearly is facing the challenge of affordability every day and the challenge of harassment against tenants every day, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. I would like to thank the Mayor and the Speaker, my colleague. I represent the district that has a higher regulated number of units in the city of New York. We compete with Buffalo at the state of New York. And from 2000 to 2010, my district lost 14,000 people. If the city will have this tool that the speaker, my colleague, and the mayor are moving today, Vantage and Pinnacle <coughs> will not be able to push so many people out as they did in the past. <laughs> and that's the reason why I'm so proud to be here, because today, my district that has that number the high regulator in the whole city of New York are in community board 12, still had to deal with harassment from many individuals who unfortunately they don't understand that the working class and the middle class who stayed in the 80s and the 90s when we were affected by drugs and crimes had the right to stay in our community. Para mí es muy importante hoy hoy Porque para nuestras comunidades, especialmente para la comunidad latina, lo que está haciendo la vocera y los colegas, si se hubiese hecho en el 2000, Pinnacle and Vantage no hubiesen sacado tantas miles de personas como ellos lo lograron hacer. Por eso, a nombre de todas nuestras comunidades, especialmente de los latinos, le damos las gracias al alcalde y a la vocera por permitirnos tener esta herramienta para proteger el derecho de los inquilinos a mantenernos en nuestros vecindarios. Thank you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to sign the bills. I think there's broad agreement on that fact. Then we're going to come back here and do questions with the media on the topic of these bills. Then I'm going to give you an update related to legionnaires, and we're going to take questions on that topic, and that is all we will be doing. So let's sign the bill.
Nikki, stay up here. Okay. I am going to repeat. We're doing questions and answers on these bills. Then I'm going to give you an update on Legionnaires. We're going to do questions and answers on Legionnaires. Then we are moving on. On these bills, yes. Kyle Mazza from UNF News. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to ask my questions. My first question is going to go to the mayor. And then after our dialogue has concluded, Mayor, I will ask my second question. You're very organized, sir. <laughs> I try to be. I'll ask my second question to Speaker Viverito. Um, first, Mayor, I want to ask you about the penalties that you describe. From your perspective, since the fines are steep, do you think that this will deter bad behavior from the landlords, or do you think it will still be present somewhat, even with the legislation? And if it is, what steps will you, the office, and other officials take? Well, I'll start, and anyone who wants to join in, please do. Uh, I think it's going to have a very major impact on stopping tenant harassment. Uh, I believe that this kind of penalty, again, $10,000 in the first instance per apartment, uh, that goes up steeply thereafter. Those are serious penalties I think will stop bad landlords from trying to harass tenants. But I certainly believe some bad landlords will think that they can go undetected and think that their tenants won't know about uh, the bill or won't know that they have these rights. Our job is to get the message out in every way, at the grassroots, in every way we can. So again, I emphasize that anyone who thinks they are being harassed should call 311 so we can get them help. We need to know if there's a problem. But if we do the outreach right, and I know a lot of our colleagues from uh, advocacy groups in this room and nonprofits in this room are going to help us get the message out, I think more and more bad landlords will realize that they will be caught if they break the law. To Speaker Viverito, I want to ask you, since Puerto Rican Court is in your district, personally for you, what does this mean, and how do you feel that this legislation is becoming law? Well, it's important, as I mentioned, about being here uh, and what the kind of housing that is reflected here and provided here uh, is one that we got to create more of because we see these pressures that exist, and the pressures exist because uh, not enough of housing exists, and obviously the landlords want to maximize their profits. Um, so uh, I think that we are very excited uh, of what what is happening here in particular, excited about these bills. And as the mayor said, it is all incumbent upon us in our offices, through our outreach, and the meetings that we go to, to let, let tenants know that this is now law and that they have the protections afforded. This is just continues to be an example of how aggressive we've been as a council in partnership with this administration to protect tenants. And we gotta make sure that tenants um, really avail themselves uh, to, to this, these protections because it's a way of maintaining them them, them, they, maintaining their home and maintaining their presence in our neighborhoods. All right, thank you. Please. I, th I think it's really important to recognize that this is one tool, and we've been trying to build that toolbox um, very, you know, very aggressively. So we've got inspectors in the field every day, making sure that harassment is not occurring in the form of you know, withdrawal of services and not repairing things. We've got a, an enormous number of tools that we're now adding to the toolbox. And in combination, they send a very powerful message to landlords. You will get caught. We will have a tool that can catch you. And um, we're, we're on it. So I, I think you have to look at the whole picture. And to follow up, if I may, on your statement, Commissioner Bean. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to the numerous calls? Because you mentioned that before to tenants from mm -hmm. landlords. Mm -hmm. How will you get them to stop with this bill? So uh, we, will, we will be very aggressive in terms of if, if, a, if a tenant calls 311, we will refer them to, uh, to lawyers. We will refer them to the legal services organizations. We will make sure that we are in there checking their, the, the landlord and the building. We will work with the task force, with the attorney general, the tenant protection unit. We will use all of those tools available to us, and we will also, you know, work hard to get the word out, along with all of our partners. On this topic of the legislation, yes. Uh, from the 311 call for the work that is being in outreach uh, door to door, have you seen more cases of harassment in the last year? Less. Is it, is, are, the, are the numbers steady? I'll give you my broad view, and then uh, Vicki or anyone else who has a sense of specific numbers on, on harassment. Look, there's no question what I have heard from New Yorkers over years and years is that as the price of housing has gone up, and there's been more, sadly, incentive for bad landlords to harass, 
uh, we're certainly seeing more and more of it. In terms of quantifying it, let me have uh, the commissioner give you a sense of that. So the best evidence that we have is tenant harassment claims that are brought in court because when people call 311, uh, they often say the landlord isn't fixing things or something like that. That may not actually be harassment. So the best evidence that we have is tenant harassment claims in court. And they have gone up, for example, in fiscal year 08, we got 42 filed in court. In fiscal year 15, we had almost 800. Mm. Okay, so that's very powerful evidence. And that's based on um, that's based on a process that's not easy for tenants. Obviously, a huge number of tenants go to housing court without representation, which is something we're trying to work on. The council Correct. cares a lot about, Legal. right? And so the point is, and the laws were not as strong as they are now. But there, we've always known there's a lot of tenants who suffered the harassment, not thinking they had any other option. So this is both about strengthening the laws but also letting tenants know they have rights and they will be defended in a way they were not in the past. On this topic, yes. First question is just a very simple question. When do these laws take effect? Uh, 90 days. 90 days. And people should call 311. They can call 311 because we have, with our colleagues in legal aid, legal services, et cetera, we have capacity. If someone is, in fact, being harassed, uh, they potentially can get that legal help. So anyone who thinks they're being harassed should call. We'll refer them to the legal assistance programs, and they'll be evaluated. And since the public advocate is now here and uh, something that started when you were public advocate, is there any dovetailing of the worst landlord list as part of this toolbox that you're talking about? And the Come on. Of the Thank you. Um, as a result of the worst landlord list, our office has referred a number of complaints uh, to the Legal Aid Society as well as legal services. We have joined with them on a quite a few um, pieces of litigation which continue to, uh, uh, to which are ongoing. Um, our office continues to get complaints from landlords and from tenants all throughout the city of New York. And partly it has to do with the failure to provide um, certain uh, benefits that they are entitled to. And our office has joined with a number of corporate firms um, in initiating litigation against landlords as a result of their failure to comply with the law. And I, I just wanted to just provide clarification that although these bills, these three bills go into effect in 90 days, that's, these bills are specific to buyout offers, right? There is already on the books existing law to protect tenants against harassment, which can take shape in many different ways. So that, that is available right now. So if someone does call 311 and says they're being harassed and they need access to a lawyer, well, there is already these certain tools in place that can help protect tenants. Okay, on this topic, on the topic of the bills and tenant harassment, Going once, going twice. We're now going to talk about Legionnaires. Let me give you an update. Okay, we uh, actually let's have Dr. Bassett and uh, General Manager Michael Kelly of NYCHA join me. Uh, Department of Health has investigated a small cluster of Legionnaires cases recently identified at the Melrose Houses, part of our public housing authority uh, in the South Bronx. Now, uh, the original case was isolated and over uh, about six months ago, oh, I should say March, so almost six months ago. There were two cases that developed during the outbreak uh, while we were focused, of course, on the South Bronx and which we have now determined to be uh, sourced by the Opera House uh, Hotel location. There is one case that emerged last week now that case is, the timing of it does not disqualify the possibility it still may have been caused by that uh, outbreak at the Opera House Hotel. But it also may have been caused, as we've said in many, many of these gatherings, it may have been caused by a different source because as everyone knows, there are hundreds of Legionnaires cases in New York City each year. Most happen in isolation. Most happen, thank God, with very little consequence uh, for the patient. So we have this one new case that we still need more information on to be able to pinpoint whether it was caused by the previous location or something different. That patient is currently hospitalized uh, and recovering. The previous patients all had been treated and recovered fully. Uh, as a result of looking at the situation at Melrose Houses, we tested the water distribution system in three of the buildings. In two buildings, we found uh, negative results. 
In one building, we found a positive result. Now, it was a very faint positive result, but out of an abundance of caution, we decided uh, that in that one building, we would take additional steps. I should note at the outset, there are six more buildings in the Melrose uh, complex. None of them have had cases associated with them, but again, out of an abundance of caution, we have tested all six, and we expect the answers back from those tests uh, by late afternoon tomorrow. Uh, Department of Health has consulted with the Centers for Disease Control, and in the case of the building that tested positive, the plan of action was to install water filters uh, to address the situation. Those filters uh, had to be brought in from out of state. They were ordered uh, yesterday. They've arrived this morning. Uh, so far, about 50 percent of the filters have been installed uh, as of uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, the uh, remaining will all be installed by tomorrow morning. So what we did was, again, all of this out of an abundance of caution. Uh, we shut off hot water at uh, that building, continued cold water. And very important to note that hot water is the context in which Legionnaire develop, Legionnaires or Legionella lives, not cold water. So cold water continued to be available. Hot water shut off late yesterday. We'll continue shut off until tomorrow. Again, we expect these filters in place. By the end of the morning tomorrow, at that point, hot water will be uh, restored. We are also adding uh, some long-term uh, actions to ensure that bacteria is killed off uh, for the long term in that uh, water system. I want to note and I want to thank the Department of Health and uh, the Housing Authority for very speedy action. The positive test result was received at 5 p.m. yesterday. Water was shut off within 45 minutes of the result. Uh, before 7 p.m., teams were knocking on the doors of all the residents in that building, and a meeting was held with the residents last night that Dr. Bassett and General Manager Kelly attended. Uh, and then I just want to finish before your questions on this topic, uh, two uh, key points that we have to emphasize. One, again, this disease is not contagious and is easily treated uh, with antibiotics. Two, and this is something we really need to remember from what we've learned from the last few weeks, anyone who has symptoms, they need to seek treatment. Now, again, overwhelmingly, this is a disease that afflicts people who are older, generally speaking, in their 50s or older, and people who have pre-existing conditions. So anyone, anywhere in New York City, who has those symptoms, persistent cough and flu-like symptoms, uh, trouble breathing, should, out of an abundance of caution, get it checked by a doctor. They should get checked by a doctor in general. They certainly should get it checked by a doctor, given what we know of Legionnaires. But people who get, and Dr. Bassett will back me up because we've, we've had this conversation many times, people get treatment quickly, even if they are older or have preexisting conditions. One of the big X factors here is getting treatment quickly. If you get treatment quickly, you have a much better chance of a full and speedy recovery. So don't explain away a cough or flu-like symptoms. Don't say, I'll deal with it next week. Just go to get treatment. Go to your local emergency room. Go to your doctor. With that, we're going to take questions on Legionnaires. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this may be a question for the commissioner. Now, the previous outbreak was cooling towers, and this you're saying is the water... No, we didn't say is. I'm going to stop you right there because, again, I want... I, on these matters, forgive me, I'm going to be very quick if I feel what I'm saying is not heard properly. This is in the abundance of caution category. We do not have a definitive result. We have an initial test positive that's fairly faint. There's further testing going on to be able to confirm if there is the presence at all of Legionnaires in that water system. As I said at the outset, this individual was within a time frame where it may have been caused by the Opera House Hotel previous to its full cleaning. But it is the water distribution system that had the faint positive. So I'm just, can you just describe what that is in layman's terms? I'm assuming that's your drinking water. And two, whether or not all of the night facilities in the entire city would get tested as a result of this faint positive. Yes, so uh, what happened in this situation was that we had four individuals who were identified who were residents of, of uh, Melrose Houses. Uh, in the past six months who've developed Legionnaire's disease. The person who's presently hospitalized uh, was 
also resident in a building in which we'd seen someone diagnosed who we'd attributed to the cooling tower outbreak earlier. We use as a general rule, anytime we have two cases arising from the same facility, the same building, in the space of one year that we check the water system. And we do this, as the mayor has said, out of an abundance of caution. So it was a fact that we had two cases that led us to check the water system in uh, this building and also led us to identify the other two cases who were also located in one building, bringing to four the number of residents of Melrose since March who have developed Legionnaires. Uh, we tested uh, the positive result was from the hot water system. As the mayor has said, uh, the uh, hot water system is uh, the environment in which Legionnaires is most likely to develop. I want to stress very strongly that the drinking water is safe. Uh, and it, also to reiterate what the mayor said, this is a preliminary test result. The actions taken in 681 Cortland Avenue are for, from an abundance of caution. We'll have additional testing as we go forward. On this topic, yes. As this uh, Legionnaire situation was unfolding yesterday, whose idea was it to mock up a front page of the New York Post as a joke and put it out on Twitter? Totally different topic. We're not going to address that right now. Go ahead. Uh, one of my questions wasn't answered. Go ahead. But the, the, all of the night shift buildings in the uh, city, whether or not they would be tested. No. 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 Again, there's two cases in this building, and obviously proximity, very close proximity to the Opera House Hotel. Uh, this is a particular situation. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm going to keep saying it, this is a form of pneumonia present in our city, has been present in our city for decades, about 200 cases a year. It's very important that we recognize how and when we should act based on the information we know. We also remember from one of the previous briefings with the CDC, uh, the vast, not the vast majority, but the clear majority of cases are related to uh, the cooling towers. That's what's obviously been addressed by the legislation with the council and the commissioner's order. But this is an isolated circumstance, and until we get the additional tests back early next week, we can't even tell you if, in fact, there is Legionella in this building. We may come back with an ultimate negative on it. But we thought, let's go the extra mile here, get these filters in place, just make sure that we are taking the precaution that made sense in this particular case. So just so I'm understanding clearly, the additional tests will retest the faint positive. Correct. To determine it gives you more detail. It gives you more detail and the ability to actually, one, to know is it Legionella, two, it gives you enough to see what the relationship is to the individual patient. When we get back information on that, too, we're going to be able to do more to figure out if there's any tie to the previous source as well. Go ahead. Anything else? Mr. Mayor. Right in the back first. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you and the Health Commissioner have addressed this plenty of time, but there is this concern because of the fact that Melrose sits kind of in the heart of where the previous outbreak happened. So this question keeps on coming up again, you know, why here, why the Bronx? So I was hoping you or the health commissioner could address again. I'll start and I'll pass to Dr. Bassett. The 200 cases a year have happened all over the city, and that's happened for years and years. So I want to separate the outbreak, which we've defined very, very clearly, and thank God is over, and was different than anything else we've seen in the history of New York City from what we do see year in, year out, these isolated cases. Again, when we have full information, we'll be able to say whether we think this is related to the last vestiges of the Opera House Hotel or whether, in fact, it is something distinct. But even if it were distinct, we will, as we've said previously, we will find additional cases, isolated cases, in different parts of the city. So you could have a situation here where the previous ones were related to the Opera House Hotel, and that was a particular moment in the South Bronx, unlike anything we've seen before. And this one may be just absolutely solitary, and like the solitary cases we have elsewhere. Until we have full information, we can't give you that final, uh, that final conclusion. Anyone else? Where do I see? I hear a voice, yes. Yeah, um so can you tell us when the last case of uh, the disease was diagnosed at this point? Or do we know that? I'm sorry, when you say the last case of the, the disease. The most recent case, the, the most recent diagnosis of this. Well, let me emphasize one thing and then turn to the commissioner. The, uh, 
a person can carry this around for a period of time, and you can help people understand that because, again, think of the symptoms, coughing, shortness of breath, flu-like flu -like symptoms. Again, I wish after all of this public discussion, everyone who had those symptoms would just go to a doctor right away. But we know, I've done it, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have done it. You say, oh, I'll deal with it later, it's not that bad. So someone can have it and walk around with it for quite a while, thank God, not contagious. Maybe you can explain that and yeah. answer this specific question. Uh, I, no, I, I don't think I have anything more to add to that. I think your question was in the South Bronx, when was the last case diagnosed? And that was a week ago today. And, and is it conceivable, the time frame, I believe uh, it was early August or we, uh, oh, yes. Uh, so that time frame, because I know you said it could be two weeks up to before they show up the symptoms? Oh, goodness. So everybody's learned a great deal. Yes, the incubation well, period incubation can be different. up to 14 days. Right, and then you can but, walk around. But. but then there's also the problem of getting sick and not seeking care. And we saw at the beginning of this outbreak people walking around with symptoms for more than a week. That's what we've worked so hard, and the people of the Bronx really rose to the occasion and responded by reducing their waiting time to, uh, on average, two days. So we made a lot of progress. We need to keep to that. People who get flu-like symptoms, headache, cough, muscle aches, uh, 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 difficulty breathing, don't take a chance. Seek medical care. Uh, we don't want to see people coming in late. This is very treatable, but the sicker you are, the more likely you'll have um, a, a complicated outcome. Maybe one more follow-up to this uh, faint positive that we're referring to it as. So, I mean, are we in a position where it could have identified some sort of bacteria that is in the strain? Is that why we can't identify this? So I'm going to start, layman, and pass the ball here. The, the first test you do, which is the quick turnaround test, roughly 24-hour turnaround, is not just about Legionella. It is, it's a broader look at the situation in the, I mean, you can explain it better than me. The later test is more detailed and gives you a, a much better picture. Why don't you? Okay. Uh, so we use as a screening test uh, for water supplies something called PCR, which tests DNA. And it can t identify DNA of the most common human pathogen that's called Legionella pneumophila. Uh, but it only tests the DNA. It doesn't tell us whether the organism is alive or not. Uh, so we know that it's, you know, that we've found something in the water. Uh, we have to culture it, which may take a week or more. And in order to do the fingerprint uh, that the mayor was mentioning that allows us to match up an, a bacteria in the patient with a bacteria in the water, uh, we need, may, it may take uh, developing a very pure culture that may take up to two weeks. So this comes later. In the case of the cooling tower outbreak, all 25 human specimens that we have fingerprinted were a match to the cooling tower uh, at the Opera House Hotel. Thanks, folks. Thank you.